Hey everyone, it's Crystal from Sober Onions Podcast. I am here with my friend Sierra. She's here local in Ventura, like me in California. And uh, Sierra is also in recovery. And I met her and I heard a little bit about her story. And she is a comedian as well, does uh, live shows here in Los Angeles. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So if you want to say hi, Sierra. Hi, everyone. And Sierra, have you, have you, are you originally from California? Yes. Okay. I'm a so California you, native. Okay. So you've been in Ventura? Since 2013. Okay. Very good. So, and Sierra is a mom. So she also has a full-time job doing that. So I was just going to ask you a little bit about yourself and then we're going to go and we're going to talk about addiction today. So tell me a little bit about you and how long you've been sober and what is keeping you sober. Okay. So I have been clean and sober for six years. I'll be celebrating seven years come April, one day at a time. Seven years. Um, Wow. Congrats. So, and I'm, you know, I'm not from Ventura, but I moved to Ventura in 2013 to kind of start my journey towards recovery. Um, and I've planted roots here and I call this place my home now. I'm originally from Santa Maria, California, where I was born and raised all my family's there um I have a little boy he's four he just turned four in June he's never had to see me loaded or drunk or anything like that which is one of the bigger blessings of being in recovery I have really just gotten to know a little bit more about like who I am in the last couple of years so I started doing comedy. It turns out that I know how to make people laugh from time to time. Sometimes (laughs) I don't get my own punchlines, but um, that has been so much fun. Like I've had so much fun doing that, you know, in the past couple of months, really, because of COVID, it's been hard. And uh, yeah, I, I have a mom I have a dad divorced parents I have siblings brothers um yeah I'm I'm really excited to be on the show yeah that's really exciting uh going on seven years that's incredible and commend you you for that and like you said you know your son's never seen you um intoxicated at all and that's huge you know unfortunately I can't deal. say yeah I can't say the same thing and that's that's a big regret of mine well let's talk about what was your bottom so they say uh, what made you decide to get sober and was it something that took a process where you you tried to get sober and relapsed or you got sober and that was it for you uh yeah so my journey to sobriety was not just a one and done. I moved to Ventura in 2013 with no idea of what getting clean even looked like. I just kind of was at this point in my life where it was like run and run fast and anything to like get away from everybody else because everybody else was the problem, right? Like it's not me. Can't be me. I'm 17 you know, my mom, my dad are divorced. Uh, My mom remarried. She was in an abusive relationship for all of my life, you know, Mm -hmm. from three to 15, she was with a man that um, just emotionally, physically, spiritually, and mentally just like tore her apart into pieces. And so I um, played the victim card for a really long time. Uh, My dad is also an alcoholic as well. Both of my parents um, suffer from the disease of addiction. And though my dad was very supportive of me, he loved me and, you know, did the best that he could still, you know, had his vices. And when I was 17, I moved here. It was everybody else's fault. And it, Sierra, uh, me, I was, it was great. You know, I just needed to get away from the problems. And, um, my oldest brother is actually in recovery. 
and he is going to be celebrating, I think, 11 years come February. Uh, Wow. And we, at the time, did not have a relationship because of drugs and alcohol. And he's 13 years older than me. So when I was born, he was in juvenile hall for like gangbanging. And um, I like really had no idea who this guy was. I know that he's my brother. I knew that I yearned for this like relationship with him. And uh, I kind of went out on a whim, hoping that he was in the right mind because there had been so many times like addicts, you know, like I'm going to change, I'm going to change, I'm going to change. And we don't. Um, I heard my brother say that and there was never any follow through, but come 2013, I, I called him while I was on my way to Ventura and I told him I needed to talk to him. And that was like me running away. And he took one look at me and told me that I wasn't going to go anywhere. Like I was staying with him. And at that point, I think he had like two years mm. clean mm. and, uh, so then he started taking, he took me to my first meeting and I had never, I had no idea what AA was or NA was. Um, I went to a meeting, I got clean, I got sober. My brother told me, you know, you can go to a rehab or you can get a job and go to school. And I decided that I was going to get a job and I turned 18, you know, shortly after my time being here. And, uh, you know, the term addict didn't sink in, you know, like it does now. Like, I just remember feeling like some hope and like, you know, I, I got away from everything. Life started getting good and, you know, therefore the problem solved, you know, and, um, I started drinking, smoking, and it wasn't long before I was using hard drugs again. So I relapsed, you know, and it took me a long time to come back into the room. So I moved here in 2013 and my clean date is in 2015. Wow. And uh, now I have a whole new understanding of what the disease of addiction is, you know, like we talk about that bottom and I lived on the bottom, you know, Mm -hmm. there, my bottom just got lower and lower. Um, I think what did it for me though, was the complete powerlessness I had. I just remember like, so outside of myself, you know, Mm -hmm. like I, couldn't control the things that I was doing, you know, and it, it literally drove me crazy. And, uh, I once again called my brother for help and I got, I went to sober living and I stayed in a sober living for nine months. I did an outpatient program. I graduated from it for three times because I'm just an overachiever (laughs) and I was scared to leave. (laughs) <laughs> and uh how does that work how does sober living work um here in Ventura so you decided you didn't have to go to um a rehab first you just went right into sober living and did you have to apply for it did you have to pay for it I'm I'm new to all this too and and I don't understand it honestly so there's just different programs uh there are programs that are funded by jails and you know that not jails but that work with p- addicts that are in jail so that you can have a home set up for you when you, when you get out and you're released and the state funds that kind of stuff. So there are programs that get funding that way. There are actual like detox center, detox centers. There are rehabilitation centers. There are sober living, you know, houses. Um, I went to sober living because that's what was suggested that I do. And at that point it was, I was desperate and just willing to do whatever. Um, and my brother, my brother paid for it for a couple of months until I was able to get back as to being a productive member of society, because I was definitely a, not that person <laughs> for a long time. 
did they and then what did they do just random drug and alcohol testing and that's how you were able to stay into the sober living was random test um my sober living was I was on a lockdown for like 30 days so okay. I wasn't allowed to go anywhere except for meetings and I had to have a buddy Okay. Um, and I had to go straight to and from the meeting and come back. And like, if I had to run errands, you know, like grocery shopping, I had to have the buddy system. Um, but basically like no freedoms the first 30 days. And there was random drug testing, but it wasn't like, uh, something that was required that you did you know you just knew if you wanted to live in the house and there was a random drug test and you didn't comply like you got kicked out mm. um chores I had chores you know so it was like taught me how to start like taking some authority even though it was just like hey you have to do the dishes today um the meetings was a huge one the outpatient one was a requirement if I was in sober living and not in an inpatient my sober living manager required that you do outpatient at the sober living. Right. So I did that four days a week. Okay. And I'm doing uh, that right now at, at, um, I'm doing it at prototypes where I went to rehab. I'm doing outpatient with them, but I only have to go once a week. Yeah. So that's not too bad. <laughs> no, I did the intensive outpatient program with ADP and it was four days a week. I still like, I see my counselor at meetings Mm -hmm. Like I saw him recently at a meeting. I hadn't seen him in years. And it's like such a gift, you know, like this man changed my life. I was like in tears, you know, cause I don't know about you, but like my bottom was dark, you know, and it took me to some really lonely, desperate places that if I ever think about getting loaded again, it's like, I have to play that tape through, you know, yeah. I need to look at the end game because I don't ever want to feel like that again. You know, sometimes I feel like the feelings that I have clean and sober are just as bad, you know, but in reality, like I have a pillar of people in my life today that hold me up you know, when I'm feeling like this, like it was just lonely when I was getting loaded. It, it's, so. it's amazing that, that we, you know, use the drug of choice as um, it's, it's a best friend. It's always there. And when you take it away, um, the clarity that you have where for me, it's, I think about things and I'm like, wow, I don't even remember that. Or I don't even recall that. Or I just remember my version because I was right in myself because it was just me and the alcohol and we were good. But then yeah. when I was alone, it was completely lonely and I felt completely down and like a failure and it did nothing for me. It, it only took, you know, but yet, yeah. I, but yet I was its most loyal customer, you know? Yeah. So it, it doesn't make any sense. And that's what addiction is. It's a disease. And I, and I believe that, you know, people that have an addiction, it's, you know, there's a chemical process there that, um, you know, acts and we act on it. And I think that, um, you know, it's really, really difficult to stay sober. Um, people don't understand that. They think, oh, well, I'm just going to, you know, dr heavily drink over the weekend or go on a cruise and, you know, and then I'm going to stop. Like people like us can't do that. You know, no. we just can't do it at all. And that's what an addiction is, you know, and some people think, oh, well, I'm not an alcoholic or I, I don't think I'm an alcoholic, but um, their addiction is prominent and you can see it. They just can't uh -huh. see it yet. And it's, and that's what happened to me. Everyone could see it. I could feel it. I could feel yeah. it. I, I knew I had a problem, but I didn't want to admit it. But, you know, you don't see what you see sober um, when you're in your addiction. Yeah. Which is, which is crazy. They say it's really hard to get sober, you know, but staying sober is, you know, one day at a time, you just get to you get that choice back, you know, and I felt like in my journey and experience that all my choices were, I had none, you know, it wasn't a choice. It, it literally felt like I was out of myself, you know, like I would not want to use, and there I was using, 
And it was like, I would tell myself, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. And yet, like, I could not stop. And that was like one of the hardest things, I think, like one of the harder pills to swallow, like how uh, dependent, dependent, but, you know, like my will, you know, and so searching for like a higher power and like, you know, kind of taking myself out of the equation, getting out of my own way um, was really helpful. And yeah, I mean, it's a disease. Like when I was a teenager and, you know, started drinking alcohol, I just, it never occurred to me that I had a problem, you know, but I do remember like my friends in high school, they'd be like, Oh, I blacked out for the first time. And I was like, dude, I can't even tell you how many times I blacked out. Like a blackout is every night, you know? And, uh, at that point I wasn't even like a freshman in high school yet. So, and now uh, that you're a mom, you imagine your kids doing that, which is like, it's so different. It changes everything. Yeah, Yeah. It changes everything. Cause you're well, like, no, no way he wouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, I remember. So my parents, like I said, both have this disease and I remember I had a counselor in eighth grade and that was like the first time that I had ever heard the term alcoholism. And my counselor had told me, you know, like if your mom had cancer, would you be mad at her? Because, she was trying to use that as like a comparison for this disease, you know, like we can't control it. And she's like, would you be mad at her if like your mom had cancer? And I was like, well, no. And she's like, well, then you can't be mad at her now. Like she has a disease Mm -hmm. just because it is, has this own form, you know, doesn't take away from the fact that it's a disease, you know, and it kind of gave me some like room to forgive her, you know? And, uh, I never thought that that term applied to me though, as I started drinking and I started like the car accidents, the, I I can't even tell you how many unsafe situations that I've been in, you know, where I have been physically harmed, sexually abused, like from using. And I think I got into a car accident when I was like 17 with a drunk driver. It was really bad. And my brother, my, cause I have two brothers, my, the middle guy, the middle man, he, uh, just begged me like, Sarah, stop drinking, you know, like you're scaring us. And like, I still didn't think like I had a problem, you know, I was just like, oh, don't drink around them. You know, don't call them when I need help. Mm -hmm. And, um, it wasn't until I kind of went when I moved here and went to the rooms, you know, and had this like big introduction to like this disease of addiction and like, you know, what I could do to like fix it, that, uh, going back out, realizing like, oh, that does apply to me, you know, like all those people I thought, you know, that's not like me. I didn't lose my kids. I didn't lose my house, you know, like looking for everything to separate myself instead of just like identifying with like the key features, which were like, I was hopeless. I was miserable. I was not having fun. I used to get away from my own self, you know, but instead it was like, oh, well, if you lost your kids and your husband overdosed, like that's not me, you know, I don't don't have kids. I don't have a husband, you know? So coming back, um, was humbling and like gave me this greater appreciation for, you know, my life because I, and today it's my birthday. Like I'm celebrating 26 and, um, I pray to God that like, I get to celebrate more years clean and sober. And I try not to future trip and try to just stay in the today. Uh, cause that's what it's all about. You know, like just living for today and, uh, being able to have the freedom to like make that choice, you know, cause if I choose to drink, you know, I know it's a conscious effort to honestly, like, I know it happens when I get loaded, 
You know what I mean? I, I know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen if I stay clean. Like I never would have envisioned my life looking the way that it does today. I couldn't even, I can't, it's like, I didn't even have dreams. You know what I mean? It was just like about surviving for so many years that like I trip out, you know, like I wouldn't even, I wouldn't have even been able to dream this up if I wanted to, like my life is so good. There are some really hard parts, you know, but I'm starting to like experience the life on life's terms and I'm trying my best to just like walk through it and, um, you know, take responsibility and like, and, and not be a victim anymore. Like I, I want to be an active participant in my life. You know, I don't want life to happen to me anymore. You know, I want life to be happening because of me and, uh, yeah, it's crazy. Because I, you know, I, uh, I agree the same thing. It, it's hard to be in the present. That's something that's so new for me. I usually am s- such a planner that everything's in front of me. And then when COVID happened, that changed everything. And then sobriety, that changed everything. So it's, it's hard for me to live in the day. It's something that I'm practicing daily with my sponsor, because um, I tend to just always think about tomorrow or worry about the kids or I'm worrying about this or worrying about that. And, um, and that's how a lot of people relapse is because they're just, they're not focused on today. And so that's one of the things that I always, you know, try to focus on every day is just, you know, it's it's so cliche because that's, you know, like the the theme one day at a time, but it, it really is. And that's what I love about sobriety is you can walk into a room, which you call is, is basically a, a meeting, a room full of people that are, uh, you know, in the same situation and whether you have one day or you have 30 years you're the same and that's just incredible that you can't go anywhere or experience that in any other venue I don't think because um you know the person who's new and uh, I was at a meeting last night and there was like four new women actually and they were within a week being sober and they were a mess, you know, and, and, and the people, and then you've got somebody who's there for 30 years and you're like, why does this person still come to a meeting? And they'll tell you it's for the new person because they see that person walk in and they look like we look, you know, like when we came in, that's what I look like, you know? And so you're, you're there for that new person. And, and it's just incredible to me that how much changes, like you said, your bottom was really dark and you can see the darkness in people when they come into the rooms right in the beginning, because everything has just fallen apart, you know, but yeah. there, but there's hope because they're, like you said, there's a pillar of people, there's, you know, there's systems, there's resources, there's all kinds of things that can help you stay sober now. And, and, um, you know, there's one of the the ladies mentioned again last night, she said, um, you know, she's been in this program for 20 something years, and it's so different. You know, back then, they just had meetings, and they knew everybody. And now, you know, you go to meetings, and you probably don't know that many people. And um, because, you know, the disease is so huge now, um, it's spread, it's the alcoholism is spreading and because they're normalizing it, um, it's becoming more acceptable. So, you know, more people are, you know, have realizing that they're having a problem with alcohol, which is crazy. So, so what, what keeps you sober now and how do you day to day, what is your practice of staying sober at, you know, almost seven years? Um, I don't work a perfect program, but, um, I try to, I try every day, you know, like I make a conscious effort to, to try. And I think that that has really carried me through a lot in the last couple of years. Um, you know, going to meetings is a luxury that I think Ventura specifically um doesn't realize like we have it so good here you know I you we can go to a meeting basically any day any hour like there are meetings that run all the time here in Ventura and um when I go to the meetings and 
I hear a newcomer share, I hear like, I get to remember that like, it, it still doesn't work, you know, like it still doesn't work. And, and that's what it's just a humbling reminder, you know, um, I get to remember that like, I'm not alone or like any different because my disease likes to tell me that your situation is different than any, everybody else's, you know, like nobody knows what you're going through. And, uh, I try to read my readings daily. I fall short, you know, I don't hang out with anybody that uses. I only surround myself with people who are sober and, um, you know, my life just looks a lot different. Like, I mean, even at my work, I work in a, like my boss, my, most of the patients know, like I'm in sobriety. Um, the only time I think I've surrounded myself with alcohol is at the comedy shows, you know? Yeah. I was going to ask you about that. Cause I was talking to my mom about that. So when you go to the comedy shows and they're, you know, at a secular venue, how does that work? How do you feel? Is it a trigger when you're doing the show and everybody's drinking or is it just they're, they're doing it and it helps your show. So you go from there. You know, not to say that I didn't struggle a lot with alcohol. I mean, that was like my first love and um, boy, was it toxic. Like <laughs> it was not a good relationship. Um, I don't really feel that triggered by it, you know? And, uh, I think that's just because more so the last like couple of years of my addiction looked a lot different. I was using a lot harder drugs and, um, I wasn't drinking a lot. So not to say that I, like alcohol wasn't my problem. It definitely was. It's all my problem, you know, anything, you know, I don't, I don't even play the game of there's like California sober. I don't know if you've heard of that where people no, like, I, stop. I heard of it. So what is that? What is California it's, sober? I it's heard- when you stop drinking, but you still smoke weed. And okay. it's like, I couldn't even do that. You know, like that is off my radar you know like why would I jeopardize my life you know because that's what it is it's life or death you know people die every single day from this disease I think we have hit an all-time high record of overdose related deaths this year alone over a hundred thousand people have died in the United States because of overdose related deaths you know and I've been to way too many funerals. Like I know the severity of this disease, you know, and unfortunately, like my drug of choice looks, I mean, even with alcohol, it's like DUIs and and drunk drivers kill people every single day. I'm not trying to say one drug's worse than the other. I mean, they're all infective, Um, but Anyways, I, I just, I, I try, you know, I, when I feel bad or I'm having a hard time, I reach out to people in the program that I respect and trust. And I ask for their word, you know, or feedback. Um, I, open my mouth, even when it's uncomfortable, I try to get vulnerable. Um, and recently I've been doing these God letters. So I write letters mm. to God okay. in my phone, which has been helpful, you know, but, um, it's like the basic stuff, you know, like you're taught when you come to the, to the program, you know, like hang out with people who are, if you're going to change one thing, you need to change everything, you know? And I did that. Um, I, I go to meetings, not as much as I'd like, but I go to meetings. Um, I have a sponsor, you know, I thoroughly believe in like what AA and NA do. Um, I try to work my steps and, and, uh, 
yeah, I just, I try to be like a participant in my life and, you know, one day at a time, like today I'm planning on going to bed sober, plan on parking my head on my pillow and waking up tomorrow sober, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah. And I, I, I just like, I just have so much to lose today, you know? And, uh, that scares me, you know, cause I, I know what happens if I get loaded, I lose it all. And, yeah. it, and it's like, is that worth it? You know, just because I don't want to feel the way that I'm feeling right now, which is temporary, you know, like feelings change and I can count on that. Like, I know it's going to change. Sometimes it doesn't feel like that, but like time and time it I have been shown that it's going to change and so if I hold on and sit on my hands some days that's what it looks like I'm just sitting on my hands all day because I don't know what to do but um yeah I can't ever imagine my son seeing me like that you know I like I'm not proud of a lot of things you know like being sober it's like an accomplishment and doing comedy is, I I love it. You know, um, all the stuff is cool, but like being a mom is the fucking coolest thing I've ever done in my entire life, you know? And I could, I could never do that, you know, but I know that if I'm not diligent and, um, stay active, you know, I, am no different than the person who had 15 years that went out and relapsed. You know what I mean? I I know that I have to remain a part of, you know? So I I try to stay close, you know? And my family kind of keeps it like, (laughs) like I said, my brother's going to be celebrating 11 years. His wife has like 25 years or something. Wow something crazy. And, um, you know, I have the people in my life are very much like on the same path that I'm on, you know? Yeah. I, I agree with you. Um, I don't feel like when you get sober, you can, uh, hang out with anybody that's, you know, I, I, I mean, if you can, that's great. I know some people that, you know, they're, their spouse still drinks and they're sober. And when you really talk to them, they will tell you it bothers them. They will tell you that it's hard. Um, They might say, oh, it doesn't, but it really does. There's, um, it's important to change your environment and the people that you're around to can maintain your sobriety. And along with all the other things that you said that you're doing, which is commendable. So I'm excited. Well, awesome. Did you have any questions for me? Yeah, I did. I I wanted to know a little bit about your story. I mean, you're from Florida. Yeah, I know that. I know I've listened to a couple episodes and I've met you personally, but, um, you know, your journey to here and, and how you found out about AA or NA or, you know, and is this your first time in the meetings and, uh, you know, like what took you so long? Yeah, I know. Right. (laughs) Well, it did take me too long. That's for sure. But I, you know, I grew up, um, like I said, in, in a great home and my, but my grandmother was an alcoholic and my, my grandfather was as well, but my grandmother was active in the AA program. So like when I was little, um, I remember going and when she would get cakes and stuff like that. So she was real, um, active in that. And she was very, uh, into her sobriety as well and a huge coffee drinker. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, I never drank coffee before and now I drink it all the time. And, um, but yeah, I, I kind of thought that I would, once the kids were doing their thing and they weren't talking to me anymore. Um, so I didn't have that. And I had been trying to come home to California pretty much since the kids were two. And cause that's where I'm from and my family's here. And finally, since the kids were older, I was able to leave and come home. And um, my, you know, I, 
because of COVID and no job and just everything changing, I just started drinking way more and way more. And then it started becoming a morning thing. I started drinking in the morning and, um, and, and just where my family, they knew about my alcoholism from my kids and just from like drunk phone calls and stuff, but they never have seen me drunk. Uh, my parents have, but my, my brothers and sisters haven't and um and we had like an event uh for a, like a family event and um and i was intoxicated and i uh like passed my niece over to my sister and almost like dropped the baby and like i parked in the middle of the of the um the street when i was going to park and so it was very very apparent to my family that something was up and i think the realization that like my facade was over over, that it was something that I couldn't control anymore. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I like, it was like the gig is up, you know, like yeah. I can't, I can't keep pretending. Um, they know like as if they didn't know before, but, um, but yeah. And then it just got so bad that my health was going down, uh, and I was ending up in the, in the hospital in the emergency room, uh, with high blood pressure and panic attacks and, um, you know, just uh, really, really high uh, levels of, of alcohol in my system. And, um, and then I drove my truck. And so that was it for me. Um, and thank God it wasn't, uh, you know, anything more than that. But that was it for me when it came to um, knowing that it was time, like I would never talk to my kids again, if I didn't get sober. Um, you know, my family, same thing. Like it was, I would never be able to be around my, my nieces and nephews. Um, so, and family is like super, super important to me, um, especially because I was away from them for 20 years. And so when I went into detox and rehab, I really had, I had no clue. So I kind of just thought it was going to be like a little mini vacation where I'd like be on my cell phone and just hang out. And I had no idea it was going to be so intense. And I had no clue that my body was going to react. I'm still like having skin issues. I'm breaking out of my chest. I just went to my dermatologist. Um, you know, I have severe neuropathy now. Um, I had it, but I was medicating myself with uh, alcohol. So the pain wasn't as bad. And now the pain is, is really, really bad. And so I'm seeing doctors for that. So, you know, I'm still, I'm only only six months sober. So I'm still in the brand new phases of everything, but it was coming here and it was really realizing that it was like, I looked myself in the mirror and went, Oh, everybody knows when they already did. But mm -hmm. I also, I also was, I think the biggest thing was I scared myself. Um, you know, there's one thing like you said, you had family who said, oh, you're scaring us, you know, and I think I scared myself. So I was like, whoa, this is, this is no good. And then when I got to rehab, um, it was miserable. I was miserable because I was completely powerless and, you know, coming from a position of, you know, I usually have like 75 employees, you know, I, I'm, you know, I have a dance studio. I'm usually in charge of everything. Um, for me to be so down and on, and on the totem pole was a big pride, uh, a pride crash for me. And so that's when I also was faced with all of who I was and how how selfish I was and all the situations I had been through and I um you know because of alcohol I was so inebriated that it was only about me and I didn't think about the people around me and I lost friends I lost jobs um but because I was such a hard worker I could always get another job real quick and I would work so hard that, uh, you know, by the time I stuck my, you know, my claws into the, the career, um, then I could start using or, you know, having my addiction and, um, you know, they didn't have a choice. They couldn't run their business without me. So a lot of my misfalls were forgiven because of that. 
And um, I just played the game for like a long time, you know, because I was always doing something and I was always involved in something. So I covered up and I overcompensated on stuff. It was like, oh, well, you know, my my daughter. Oh, well, you know, you just saw me, you know, drunk and, and passed out. Here's a here's a Mac, <laughs> you know, yeah. we're good. We're good now. Right. <laughs> I'm best mom ever. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, those are the things that, you know, all of a sudden you start thinking about because you have this clear mind and this clarity because, um, you know, you're starting to work on yourself and like now, you know, I'm reading and, you know, I'm, I'm back to church every week. I'm doing all the things that I was doing before. And they say that when you get sober, your mind goes back to uh, where you were before you drank, you know, so it's a very immature mind. Because um, a lot of what, you know, I experienced was uh, delusional. It was very mm-hmm. delusional. Growing My, up, Crystal. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> so technically, I'm like You're 21. Pains. I'm yeah. 21. <laughs> so um, yeah, so it's it's an interesting roller coaster. But I I definitely, you know, I, I look at people now, and you know, I want to be of service and help because I wish that. I didn't, a lot of times my pride was what got in the way of me quitting because there was plenty of times I said, you know, I should quit and I wish I would have, but, um, I was so prideful because I wanted to prove that I, what I didn't have a problem. I wanted to, I wanted to prove to everyone that I didn't. So I would continue on and continue the facade and okay, well now I'm on the cover of magazine. So you can't call me an alcoholic now. You know, like there's just so many things that I would overcompensate. Look at what I'm doing. Yeah. And, so, um, but like, don't look at what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so that's kind of where I was at. And that, that was how I, it ended for me. But I don't remember any resources. I don't remember anyone saying, you know, I have a problem. It was like, if you were an alcoholic, you were in jail you had, you know, like multiple DUIs, you didn't have a house, you didn't, I just didn't have that circle of people that were like, hey, I'm a regular mom, and I have a problem. And now they're all kind of starting to come out of the woodwork. You know, Mm -hmm. I know, I don't know if you know, know, saw the Amy Schumer thing that was all over the place. Um, Yeah, yesterday, how she got totally trashed, which I was really happy about, where she's uh, holding her kid over a shoulder, and then she goes and she takes a drink and she says this is a reason why I'm drinking and she's a comedian and I love her um but what she was representing was oh well I'm a mom and I'm working really hard so I can drink and she did it right on top of the kids so she got really really hammered it's a video you can find the video everywhere it ended up getting a ton of bashing on social media and people are going back and forth but um I think as a comedian she was just being funny um, but there's a lot of people so oversensitive about things right now. And of course they just need something to talk about, but, um, yeah. you, you have a son and you take him to the meetings and, um, what does he think? How do you explain it to him? Because you've always been sober around him. So if he's going to a meeting and he's never seen you intoxicated, how, what does he think these meetings are? Or is he just too young? And it's more of just a, Hey, this is something that mommy does and we're doing it. Yeah. I, I, don't think he understands, you know, um, he gets to see people that he loves there. You know what I mean? So I don't think he associates it with anything bad, you know, cause like I said, I only surround myself with people that are clean and in the program. So, um, he runs into people that he calls his aunt there, you know, or like, you know, like we see our family there. And, right. uh, so it's not like alarming to him, you know, and, um, I had, you talked about being of service. Um, I had a commitment when I got clean for like the first five years of my recovery. I had the same commitment every Thursday. It was like clockwork, you know, like it literally, sometimes I would drive to the meeting and it wasn't even happening. You know, like I got so accustomed to going to this meeting, but I would take my son in when he was a small baby, you know, like the, he's grown up in the rooms and, uh, Right now it's, yeah, more so like, we're just going to go do this thing right now. Um, and I just, you know, I'd rather you have call him. it a meeting or what do you say? Yeah. You just say yeah, we're I going say, to a meeting. Okay. I say we're going to a meeting, you know, and that's a personal 
choice. I think that any anything's going to have controversy, you know, when you're talking about drugs and alcohol, it's a really fine line of what's going to be appropriate for someone's lifestyle and what's not appropriate for someone else's, you know, and for you, you talked about, uh, you know, not being able to relate, like you thought that the disease looked like jail institutions and death, you know, and Mm -hmm. I relate to that when I got clean, that's what I thought it looked like. And so I left, you know, and I'm, I'm pro it's scary to think that like, I could have never made it back, you know, and like, God willing, I got a second chance. Yeah. And, uh, it took me, it's like, why couldn't I just be okay with how things were when I first got clean? You know, why did I need to see jails, institutions and death to like, realize that maybe I had a problem, you know, right? like it didn't need to look the way that it did, you know, like it's okay to have a problem, but not get a DUI and, you know, not, um, end up in a mental institution, you know, like you can still have a problem and still live on the bottom there, you know, yeah. like everyone's bottom looks different. And, um, I personally would rather my son be at a meeting than at a crack house, you know? Yeah. yeah so definitely. that puts things in a perspective for me. Um, I know, and I'm like, I'm mama bear, you know, like nothing's yeah. gonna happen to that little boy. That's you right. Know? And is there, uh, is there anything that you're really passionate about or that you do any service for or that you promote when you um, do your comedy comedy shows or just in your personal life? Um, you know, the last couple of years I've done care kits for the homeless. Okay. And uh, I've made about over 380 bottles in the last okay. two years and delivered them to the homeless. Wow. Um, I am not affiliated with any church organization, nonprofit. So I do it all on my own. I raise, I don't make any money. I just raise the money and I make these little care kits. They have like socks, toothbrushes, razors, just like basic needs. Um, each bottle will have a handwritten note of encouragement. And, uh, for the last two years, I have passed them out during the holidays. Wow. And, uh, it's a lot of work, you know, those homeless people, you know, they're needy. And, uh, uh, I've really enjoyed doing that. Comedy has been great. I, I just really Scott's I'm just getting started. It feels like with that, you know, cause I got started in 2019 December so then you think COVID happened in March so it's like I dipped my toes in the water and they were like the floor is lava get your toes out now and so I like got a small taste burnt my tongue basically and then it was like you know out of sight out of mind I was on lockdown quarantine me and my kid were Pinterest I was a Pinterest parent you know doing Pinterest activities like no other. And, uh, you know, we're in 2021 and things have been consistently open, you know, because it's like things would open up and then they close back down. Things would open up and they close back down. And so it was really hard for me to like find my niche, you know, like where I was going to go to the open mics because I knew nothing about it. It was like, I started, I did it once. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh, okay. And, um, yeah, I've really ventured out. I basically did like a mini tour, you know, self-made tour. I did a couple shows. I performed on the same stage that Kevin Hart's performed on, which is absolutely mind blowing to me. Wow. And, uh, that was the first time I ever performed in LA. And I was so scared, Crystal, and so nervous. I literally forgot everything I was going to say. And it was the best show I'd ever done. And then I did another show at the Hollywood Comedy. I did a show in San Luis Obispo. My family got to go out and see that one. I've been in Oxnard, Santa Paula. I'm back in, I'm going to be in Pasadena this Saturday doing a show. And uh, yeah, it's been a blast, you know, like being uh, able to laugh has been my like 
I don't know how I would get through life without being able to laugh. You know, I don't know how people don't like are so serious, you know, like, I don't get it. I'm like, I can't, I can't do that lifestyle. Like I have to have. Yeah. I'm the same way. I, I had somebody at the, one of my meetings and she said, uh, how, how many days do you have? And I think I was like three months or something. And I said, I'm, I, I'm three months. And she's like, what? She's like, you're smiling too much for three months. And I was like, what What am I supposed to do? Walk around and be miserable? I mean, like, it's hard, but like, I'm not going to walk around with a frown on my face all the time. But yeah, yeah it's like, it, it, it was funny. Cause she's like, yeah, people just aren't happy lately. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, a lot of that has to do with COVID and everything, but yeah, definitely laughter is, is everything. It really the best is. Best medicine. It, it really is. It really and is. So the best being medicine. able to have like a room full of people laughing with me or at me. I don't know what they're doing, you know, but like has been so rad, you know, and to like, I'm afraid of everything. Okay. Like everything, like fear has dictated my life in addiction and in sobriety, you know? And it's like the one thing that I am so scared of, but I do it anyways. And so it's like my it's like my thing, you know, like the courage, like one of those spiritual principles that I try to practice and teach my son, you know? So, and he's like gone to go to shows that, you know, are like more kid friendly, of course. And then, uh, like he literally, I think the last show I did, he got on stage and grabbed the microphone and tried to tell a joke, you know? <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, that's awesome. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story and uh, getting to chat. It was awesome. I really, really had a good time. And um, with that, I'm going to say thank you so much to Sierra. And I will put in the show notes a little more about Sierra, where you can find her. And with that, I'm going to end. If you guys want to be a sponsor or or donate to the show it's paypalme.com slash sober onions you can find all the episodes on spotify and now excitedly on apple so with that thank you so much sierra thank you for You're having awesome. me i'm sure we'll be seeing each other soon and happy birthday and happy uh, almost seven years so yeah congratulations <laughs> yeah thank you so much guys and again remember if i can do it we can do it Thanks, guys.